everyone, and welcome. I'm Anna Bross. I'm the head of communications for The Atlantic, and we're so thrilled to have you all here this morning for a conversation about the Glorias, which of course is based on Gloria Steinem's life and her life's work on behalf of the women's movement. Um, the Atlantic is a media partner of the Sundance Film Festival for the second year, and as part of that, we are really thrilled to be leading conversations with films and with makers that elevate, inform, and challenge our way of thinking. We are so grateful to the Institute and to Canada Goose for hosting us in this intimate space. We're also lucky to be in this room right now. And with that, I'm going to introduce Gloria Steinem, who really needs no introduction. <laughs> um, and, and Julie Taymor, who's the director of the Glorias. Together, and together with my colleague, the Atlantic staff writer covering culture, Shirley Lee. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. Before we begin, I just wanted to provide a little context on The Glorias for those of you who haven't been able to catch a screening here uh, in Park City just yet. So The Glorias is based on Gloria's memoir, <laughs> My Life on the Road. It's an unconventional memoir. It, uh, I mean, it covers her lifetime, but not necessarily in chronological ways. Uh, it tells it tells stories in relation to her to her travels around the world. Uh, and so what Julie has done is taken that book and packed it all into a two hours and 19 minute film. So I want to start there. <laughs> I mean, that's quite the challenge. I want to know what moments across Gloria's lifetime were at the very top of your wish list that you absolutely wanted to see translated to screen. I know this is odd, is this Anya? But I actually think the uh, early part of her life. And I think be be the reason I, I feel that is because many of us are familiar with, with Gloria from Ms. Magazine on. At least you've seen there's HBO docs, there's lots of uh, accessibility to Gloria from that age, so weird that she's sitting here, from this woman from that <laughs> age on. But, but what, <laughs> what startled me was her mother and father and, and her upbringing and how she became the activist that she became, her time in India, uh, the talking circles, where that, where that started, her ability to cross cultural, um, racial boundaries. This, to, to see the later Gloria is not to know Gloria. Mm -hmm. To see the earlier Gloria and to see the women who have made Gloria who Gloria is, and that's only because Gloria is Gloria. Not everybody who cross, who meets black and Indian and you know goes there becomes a full, rich human being with such generosity. But you know, even the part with her dad, Leo, and then she sh she she said to me the other night, and I'm gonna let I'm not gonna put your words in my mouth, but oh, it sounds so much better. <laughs> Well, can I say what she said, which moved me? She said the thing that startles her is the life of her mother and the death of her father. And I think that puts it so succinctly, as she can only do, because I'm not <laughs> succinct. Uh, although the movie is short for 80 years, you know, it is, it is short for 80 years. But that kind of paper moon relationship, you know, we, w if, you, if you see that relationship with Leo, uh, the traveling, the little girl, and then you think about her relationship to men. And, and, I, and I think that Leo b is the main man in her life. I mean, the other good man is, is um, Charlie Soap, Wilma Mankiller's husband. And I, 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 was, I really wanted to make sure that the men were good in the movie. Even the men who have, this is important to me, the New York Times Magazine editor, I like that guy. And he liked her. And, it's, and I've seen too many sexist movies about sexism and TV shows where they're assholes, frankly. And I don't feel that these guys were. I feel like they're men who respected Gloria, who didn't quite get how far advanced she was as a writer and an intellect, but who wouldn't be turned on to her physically. I mean, this is, this is something, maybe because I'm from an older generation, it just doesn't, it doesn't shock me. What I loved was her reaction. <laughs> Put the letters down and leave. Now, not every woman can do that. I understand that. But I think it's such a simple reaction. She made in, in one second, these are the high points for me, that in one second she made that, that decision that I can't stay here. I, it'll happen somewhere else. I'm a freelance woman. I can make it. I don't have any money, but I can make it. So that was a very important moment. 
she dedicated her book to her abortionist, or not to the abortionist, to the doctor who okayed, right? Mm -hmm. That You that name him. <laughs> and she named him. But what guts, what guts to dedicate a book to the man who said to her, promise me two things. One, you will never tell anybody my name, which she did, but he was dead. After he was long <laughs> dead. I and the other is you will do what you want to do with your life. Can I just say, but I think what Julie has captured is something that I hadn't thought about in a while, and I think may be true for an, a lot of us, which is that we are like those ru nested Russian dolls, you know? So our earlier selves are all still within us, and we don't remember it all the time. I mean, what's moving to me, too, about the movie is that you reactivate the layers of Russian dolls <laughs> in me, and they talk to each other. Could I give it, because there's something that, yes, I didn't talk about that, because the idea of the Glorias, and we have four or five of them, well, five of them, I shouldn't say four or five, <laughs> um, talking to each other was a, was a way that I could actually glue her book together. But I'm going to give you one example, and it might ruin it if you haven't seen the movie, but you're here, so too bad. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're getting too much information. You should go see a movie without knowing anything. <laughs> but one thing that I feel is, Gloria is always called an icon. And uh, I said this yesterday, but it was a revelation yesterday because I heard it again the night before. And an icon to me is something that's not living. It's, it's a sculpture. It's hard. It's stone. It's wood. It's gilded. It's religious. You know, all the things that Gloria is. You know, <laughs> And... and um, and for me, the, the thing that I wanted most to do was to, to really get to her humanity and to her vulnerability and to the various facets. So an example is, and, bec and I'll tell you why, another reason. People look at finished products, and I've been through this too, and, they, and especially about women. They, they, they lay a trip on them, and they think that they have no humor, no vulnerability, they're hard. What do we hear about our candidates, our female candidates? As women leaders, we go through this all the time. So the fact that when Gloria goes to a Min a Minneapolis to speak at the church, and she's in that taxi where all the anti-abortionist right-wingers are screaming, ba uh, Gloria Steinem is a baby killer. Gloria Steinem, you know, they just the hate, the vitriol. I put the six-year-old girl in that moment because that's how we feel. And people don't know that. People don't actually know that, no, it's not the one who comes out of the car looking composed, looking like she's not you know, going to be affected by this. She is weeping. So she is inside that car going, what the fuck am I doing here? Do I have a right to be here? Are people going to, am I going to hurt people? Are people, you know, so she says in the church, You're, I'm as surprised as you are that I'm here, and she laughs. Well, that's Gloria, she laughs. But I felt that through the Glorias, the various uh, young women, and you know, the various five Glorias, that we would be able to show what's the inside yeah. of what's going on. Julie, you referred to it in another interview as a bus out of time. Uh, I mean, when I think about this film, so I saw it yesterday, as you know, uh, it's quite the marriage of memoir and uh, storyteller. I mean, you are such a visual director. Uh, I don't know if, <laughs> for more context, <laughs> just watching Julie's uh, older films like Frida and Across the Universe, there's such a stylistic flair. And so The Bust Out of Time incorporates all, all of the Glorias that she casts in the film and they interact at times. So Gloria, I wanna know, when you first heard this pitch, I mean, what made you say yes? What was your reaction? Well, when Julie first said she wanted to make a, a, a film based on my book, I mean, I said yes because I had seen her films. I mean, I would have said yes to anything she asked me. I mean, you know. <laughs> but uh, I didn't understand how she was going to do it because... Neither did I at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to write a book that covers 80 years because you can d have different chapters and you can leave spaces on the page and you know that the reader's going to make the leap. And so I had no idea how she was going to do this. And that's the genius of the bus out of time, I have to say. 
you know, that she just totally invented. There's nowhere in the book. There's not even a bus in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a greyhound, right? Yeah, we got a greyhound. <laughs> yeah. And now we're going to get on a greyhound and get people to vote. But anyway. <laughs> But it's such a genius way of going through time and other and people getting on in different moments and talking to each other and looking out the window and seeing different eras and seeing things from the past and uh, you know it's, it's it's just a genius you know I could not possibly and that's part of why I always I kept saying to people who would say to me did you have approval I said are you kidding me how could I approve you know <laughs> a genius. She invented all these things I could not possibly. Um, and that also rejuvenated in me the Russian doll effect because now I also find it moving, you know, to see previous selves talking to each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Gloria, I know you're no stranger to a set. I, I remember your cameo in the first Wives Club. <laughs> You've shown up. <laughs> You've shown up in TV projects, movie projects before, but what was it like stepping on the set of a movie about yourself and then, spoiler, I mean, this got revealed already, and making your cameo on that bus? Well, uh, um, I've rarely been on a movie set, and th so first of all, I was just totally knocked out with the ingenuity of doing, I mean, it was like a big airplane hangar, there were how many different sets on the, the bus was there, there was a movie, the, the father and daughter going into the movie, there were, there were all these, uh, it was the, it was the only Vegas, was it there, there were, yeah, yeah we there were, it, it was their last day on the set in Georgia, and I, you know, was just astounded, <laughs> you know, but I did get a big shrek, I have to say, when I saw a father and daughter going into the movie, because that not was... Not in the movie, unfortunately. <laughs> Never mind, I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> no, I was just astounded at the ability to produce uh, authentic emotion in an inauthentic setting. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing, I, I'm sorry for the spoiler alerts, but on that bus, now that you know she's on the bus, is our crew. Just so that you know that that's that those are the people, all those women on that bus, and the few good men that are there. We we did allow some of the male crew on because, but yeah, you'll see Rodrigo Prieto, you'll see Sandy Powell, you'll see the makeup designers, you'll see, you'll see all of the people on that bus. Our producer is there. She happens to be behind somebody, so you may not <laughs> see her. But um, yeah, yeah, it was it was they died when she showed up because it was the last day and and you know you have all the glorious and then we're all the glorious really so that was an amazing day now julie you've done a biopic before uh you did frida the difference between that one and this one is that you have your primary source in front of you you can ask her any question you want first of all what was at the top of your list that you wanted to ask glory about i'd have to remember this now do you remember what were the first things I don't, my main role was just a answering informational right. questions. You were right. there, Lynn Hindi, our producer. Yeah, but you said you wanted to ask her a lot about her childhood. Childhood, yeah. Out. Yes, I mean, there were, there were the whole barbershop, um, which we all love very much, the barbershop scene where she, she meets this little girl, Ruby, who, who can tap dance better than she because she wanted to be a dancer. Um, she told us that story, and I, I just felt that 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 had to be in the film and was so moving because it had nothing to do with politics or anything. It was two young girls who bonded together over tap dancing and the kind of generosity of the barbershop of the men. It was a black barbershop and, and the, the, this little white girl walks in, which is very awkward for a male you know, barbershop in the first place. And that is the beginning of her going outside of her own milieu into another so comfortably with such open arms given to her. And uh, so that was one one thing. <coughs> the what? The knives. Oh yeah, people don't know about the the that. Yeah, I really was I really was a magician's assistant as one of my many jobs while I was in <laughs> high school. Yeah, and she and she dressed up in fourteen in what would have looked like a bunny suit, frankly. Yeah. I mean, he did throw knives at me and so on, and uh, right, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, and there was another couple who were singers, who were girlfriend and boyfriend and so on, and he 
escaped from town with our money. He never paid us. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like your whole life. <laughs> Gloria, when you were reading the script, uh, I'm wondering which scenes maybe you were surprised that Julie included from your life that weren't in your book. I, I don't think I read the script actually. I yes, think you did. well, I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I looked at the script, but oh, you mean you didn't deeply read the script? Yeah, no, because That's how I, I read your book. I'm <laughs> no, but I'm not capable of. Uh, I'm really not capable, I think, of reading a script and understanding what it's going to show. Right. So, I mean, I, it wasn't until you started to ask me questions that I really felt like I was participating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, Julie, I, I want to ask a little bit about casting each of the Glorias. So, uh, we've got Julianne Moore, Alicia Vikander, two Oscar winners, and then two fabulous younger actresses. How did you find them? And, Gloria, did you get to meet every one of them and talk to them for a while? Well, not, I mean, I wasn't part of the, I just mm. trusted her to do you the Helped casting. with getting Bette Midler. Yes, she yeah, called no, I Bette called Midler. up Bette Midler, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it's easier than going through agents and everything like that, so she <laughs> told me to call up Bette Midler. So <laughs> casual. And Bette Midler is, I love Bette Midler, and Bette Midler is so great as Bella Abzug oh, in this yeah. film. She is fan-fucking-tastic. <laughs> she is totally great, right, right. And she said she had the hats. Yeah. Yes. She said, great. She said, oh, I love Belle. I love Belle. I still think I see her campaigning in the streets of New York. And I have the hat. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think you all know it, but at the 50th birthday party, Bet, uh, Bet was a singer. Yeah, Bet sang at my yeah. 50th birthday party, <laughs> right. So I almost asked her, but it would have been odd if it was Bella Abzug up there on the stage singing, so. Yeah. No. <laughs> now, going back to casting the Glorias then, yeah, what, what well, were you looking the, for? The young girls, I think that Lulu Wilson sent sent a tape and I didn't audition anybody else her, somebody was smart enough she was the first person we saw and she got the part based on her tape mm -hmm. and the other Ryan um, Armstrong Kira Armstrong she auditioned like many girls by tape you know you're in Savannah and you're, you're casting and that's what you have to do as a director so you, you we had a, uh, our main casting people t Telsey mm -hmm. they got lots of uh, auditions and then we had local people local casting people from Atlanta and and so I just did the normal audition process. But I, I'm, I'm kind of good at that. I mean, I really will say, people say, oh, you're so visual. But frankly, casting is not my weakness. It's, uh, if you look at the other movies, there have been some really fine performances by unknown actors. I'm not just saying, you know, you get a Julianne Moore. She's the first person we cast. Mm -hmm. And we had to go out with, to raise the money and everything. We knew Julianne Moore, look, we knew that she would be able to do Gloria. Finding the younger, the Alicia, was a little bit more, well, who's going to do this? Who can actually have the beauty, the brains, the unusual nature? And I, I, at, at first, because Alicia hasn't done that many American roles, there was a question about can she nail the accent and her accent. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was the only, I wouldn't really say full reservation, but the only quandary was, be, but as far as everything else, and she, she and I spoke on the phone, and her passion, her mother was an a, is a very political person, and her love of the material and the part, we j I, I just was so excited when she said she wanted to do it. And, and the miracle is to me that the scenes in India are exactly, I don't know how she did this, because to replicate India at that period, you know, on the train and in a village, and it's exactly right. And the women in the train, train car, yeah, are well, some exactly of them. Right. One is an actress; the rest are not. But the th I went to Indonesia when I was. I did that trip, like you went to India right after college. I went to Indonesia. I stayed four years. I had the exact same train ride in Java. In in a actually, we were all on the floor in a cart with with animals and women and children and got the exact same questions. Why aren't you married? Where's your husband? Do you have children? I, it was not foreign to me. But the other thing is we had an amazing Indian crew. You know, I wouldn't go to another country and have my whole crew come. We had Rodrigo Prieto, Sandy Powell from afar, worked with in local Indian costume designers who knew how to do the period. We had a phenomenal crew. Take One was the head, and they they did their job. They make movies in India, so they know what they're doing. And I, I really want to pay respect to them because they did the job of making sure that the period, the cars, getting that train 
that train, we went this way and this way and this way. And they're going, okay, okay, watch out. It's going to have to stop now. Timing is coming, it's coming, it's coming. Because we had to get off. It's a living train track. So, you know, it was, it, you know, go to the other side. Thank God, the other side of the train. Because we shot all of that writer, in the right? day. <laughs> but it was, um, it was for, Ali and we only brought Alicia. So we had, a, we had five people come from the United States. And the rest were a phenomenal Indian crew. And... I, you know, having lived like like Gloria abroad for many of the years of my life, this is comfortable for me. This is not something foreign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not much culture shock at this point. Maybe. Not in my life. <laughs> <laughs> culture shock is Americans and critics. <laughs> Those are always culture shocks. <laughs> now, the another fascinating thing about the film is that as it moves on from, you know, the, the smaller nesting dolls <laughs> from her childhood and on to, you know, the, the 60s, the movement, um, and all these, I'm trying to avoid the word icon now, <laughs> all these, all these figures, <laughs> yeah. um, it kind of almost plays like a documentary. You found a lot of archival footage, and I understand that by the time we get to present day, you had shot Gloria the night of the 2016 election. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that was like, and then the decision to remove it from the film? Well, Gloria, we, this was four, four years ago when we started with the book, where we uh, bought the book or whatever we did. And um, I guess we all, all of us in this room thought that the election night would end with a have a different ending. So Gloria invited us and Samantha Powers opened up her apartment at the Waldorf and 40 female ambassadors from around the world were there and you walked into such excitement and such positive, hopeful energy and we shot it. We had um, TV gals, Beverly and Bobby, uh, Berleffi, um, they, uh, what's the other name, last name? Yeah. She, we, they came uh, we, we, as documentary filmmakers. There was no script yet, but I knew that we wanted, and we, they also covered um, her going out and giving talks. But the, the night of shooting that election was so depressing that it was as if the, the, the whole room sagged and watching each of these women go out of the room at different times when they saw the, what the outcome would be and having to get back to the babysitter or back to, you know, these women from Ghana, from Cambodia, from around the world, to be an ambassador from those countries, you knew what it took for those women to get to that position and what, they, what their husbands had to give up or their expectations of what their life would be like and knowing that the funding, the women's programs work would be out the window. It was horrendous. And then the, the, at the end of the night, she was one of the only people there, and she said, I have to go to the Javits Center because I am a foul weather friend. And But before she went, she said, all right. Not at all flummoxed. I mean, seriously, so weird. What is it behind that face? But she said, uh, she said, okay, now we have to look for the upside of the downside. And that is Gloria in a nutshell. That is, um, or an icon. <laughs> that is, that is her. And so, that's great. But the material, we we just felt when we got there, and it was in the script, that it was just too depressing. That's not where we are. We're not there right now. In fact, I'll tell you what ended up taking its place. Then we did shoot the Women's March, and that was exhilarating. But what took the place of that scene was the was the article. And the article that Gloria wrote the day after blew my mind, and I found it later. And that was being able to encapsulate what Hillary's loss means. And I'd rather that you speak about it because she's here. So, you know. Well, I was just thinking, I mean, I think what we don't understand or what we know and forget is that the most dangerous time is right after a victory because that's when you get a backlash. So we had had eight years of Obama. We have a profoundly racist country, at least not all of us, by, but we're all struggling, but say a third of the country is seriously, devotedly racist. And uh, also how many times in history have we had eight years of one party and not got the other? So, you know, we didn't anticipate that backlash. And I think that's the lesson to me that we have to keep remembering that, you know, that we, P uh, there were not lynchings during slavery. There were lynchings during Reconstruction, right? 
so and we have a victory and we think you know and we forget okay now is when we so that to me was the, the the big lesson that I was trying to get across not so I mean it's true that I'm a hopeaholic okay I am a hopeaholic but <laughs> I, I was not trying to be optimistic I was also trying to be realistic in the sense that we have to recognize that this was inevitable and this has instructed us and you know this asshole that we have in the White House is <laughs> instructing us at a high level of you know what's wrong with the country and we have to use this to activate ourselves. And you talked about in that article that for women to get to that inevitable break that glass ceiling or get to that place is not a straight line that it's a, a zigzag right. and that Hillary's loss actually will allow more women which I think look what happened with the Congress it, what she said the day after the election is exactly what happened. And, and so I felt that watching her at the typewriter write this right after was as a, an inspiring way to look at a loss. And that would keep, keep us going. So then we come back to the bus. And you're all right, are we there yet, says the little one, says the little Gloria. No one answers because not really, but we're still going to Washington. Haven't we been here 20 times? A gazillion times. Are we going to stop going? No fucking way. I mean, this is the thing. So you're not allowed, uh, by Gloria Steinem's theory, to, to get depressed and to stop. Because if you do, there's just, then, you, then you're responsible, basically. You're, you're responsible for where we are. So I, I think that that's what I hope, is that that inspirational hope, 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 See, I'm not. <laughs> She's made me, but I can't say the word. I've never used it. Hopeaholic. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of H's. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope that, that, that it's uh, contagious, basically. Uh, we will turn to audience questions shortly, so please prepare those in your minds. Uh, but I do have a couple questions uh, to wrap up with. Um, Gloria, I know you're a big fan of statistics. A, a lot. <laughs> Only if I like them. <laughs> Well, a lot more than you, you <laughs> than public speaking, at least, <laughs> we'll put it that way. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, because we're on the subject of activism, uh, you know, with art. This film is obviously being re uh, released during an election year, and I wanted to start off with a couple of stats about the industry. So the percentage of top-grossing films that were featuring female protagonists rose from 31% in 2018 to 40% in 2019, which is a historic high. Uh, the number of directors of the top 100 grossing films uh, were women, uh, doubled, oh, I did not write, I did not say that correctly, doubled <laughs> since 2018, which is another historic high. Now, the antithesis to that is that in smaller, when you look at it in smaller pieces in terms of race and ethnicity, the percentage of black women in speaking roles in film declined in 2019. Uh, the number of female uh, roles uh, who have identifiable occupations and to be shown working on screen also decreased. And so when you hear these statistics, we are in the middle of you know, a, a significant movement, at least since 2017. What is the key to sustaining the increases and not taking those steps back? Well, if the question is, where does the money come from and who's doing the hiring? You know, I mean, that's pretty basic, <laughs> right? And, and we're not there yet. I mean, we're congratulating each other that we are more likely to be hired, which I'm all in favor of, but we're where does the money come from? And, you know, who has the power is still different. And also, I think especially with racial representation and you know, gay and lesbian and trans, I mean, you know, it depends who is doing, I, I think we, we press and carry on and we get some token <coughs> changes and then it goes back, <laughs> you know, so it is, once again, not a straight line, but a jagged line. Actually, speaking of financing, Julie, I understand that you did have a little trouble finding financing for this film, or at least nobody was willing to put in uh, more than 10 million, correct me if I'm wrong, time about I mean the, the thing that we we got when we went out to Hollywood in the beginning was basically a fear that it's probably a political film and it's for women 
Well, which is absolute nonsense. It's not for women, it's for people. And so I didn't feel that, that would be nice. I would have loved to have made it for 10 million. That would be great. I'm not opposed to that. But her life is too big for that. And why should she, of all heroes in our country, be treated as if it's a, a, a little low budget movie when you get these epic Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King, LBJ, all the big heroes that we've heard about and have had multiple movies <laughs> made about them and TV shows. Why don't we have that with the women? I mean, yes, Frida was an $11 million film. I'm glad I could do that. We shot in Mexico. You know, there, it was a different thing. Her story takes place across 80 years and across um, many, 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 many locations. So she took us, and we, we, we are not going to say who gave us the money because they don't get involved in the entertainment business. But this was raised through not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. And the people who actually gave the money, if it recoups, which we hope it does, they don't care to recoup their money. They wanted to go to women's causes. And it's up to Gloria to choose those causes. Yeah. What could be better? <laughs> Just lastly, before we turn to audience questions, you mentioned the fear that this will only, that people will see this film as a film only for women. Now, obviously, there are men in the audience. Um, and I'd love for both of you to talk about what you hope men, well, what you hope young men specifically take away from watching this film. Do you want to take Well, I think, you know, there's a huge generational difference, right? I mean, you know, if only the young men had been around when I was young. <laughs> but I found good men because I had a good father. I, you know, I'm, I to always say I'm totally grateful to my father because it's because of him that I am still friends with all my old lovers because they were such good people. Right? <laughs> but, but I do think uh, that it's, it's different now. And I do feel, and just here at Sundance, you know, Lots of, of young men here have come up to me seeing the film and just identified with it because it's about a social justice movement with which they identify. Uh, I mean, you know, hello, we are all human beings, okay? <laughs> and the world is divided into two kinds of people, those who divide it into two and those who don't. And we are <laughs> becoming much less a group that gender is made up, okay? The Native Americans who were here before us and still here, and thank you for doing a dedication at the beginning, you know, and saying, you know, land. whose land this is, uh, did not have uh, languages with he and she in it. They did not have a word for race, all right. This bonkers, patriarchal, racist stuff that we've been living with is not human nature. So I think we are finally beginning to see that we have more, that we have way more in common with each other as human beings than the small divisions of, of gender and race and you know everything else we know. All right. <laughs> yes, please put your hands together. <laughs> uh, we have time for audience questions. Please raise your hand. Uh, we have a mic runner in the back, so she'll be choosing. Thank you both so much, um, so much respect for you both. I had a question for Julie. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, you gave the statistics, um, and I was curious about how getting more women in positions of leadership on film sets, how did you deal with that on the Glorias? And, you know, what's your advice in general for other women filmmakers based on um, how you've been able to make films and be so successful for where few other women have? Well, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> um, well, on the Glorious in particular, I wanted to work with Rodrigo Prieto because I just love him. And I did Frida with him, and I did Midsummer. So there wasn't any question about would I, get, would I just arbitrarily go to find a female a DP. But I'd work with Sandy Powell. Great, she's a woman. Kim Jennings worked on, who did the production design, worked on um, Across the Universe and The Tempest. She had been the art director. so. She was, this is like her first real movie as production designer, so bravo, <laughs> Kim Jennings. So I had had a, a female editor my whole life, Francoise Bonneau, who, who passed away, which devastated me. And then we were,
were looking for a female editor because actually female editors have been the top editors forever. They are because they stitch things together and they're the power behind the throne. And they really, we, you know, editors, all the great ones, whether it's Thelma, I mean, they're, they've been in that position forever. Um, crew, you saw, we had a lot of female on our crew. And I, 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 I thank, take my hat off to my producers for finding those, those people. Um, am I missing? It's a pretty balanced crew, male and female, which quite honestly, I like because that's the world. And I, and I love the men on my crew because they love the glorious. And, and the men who've seen this film, going back to here, the first thing they said, like Michael Barry, who's our sound mixer, or some of the other ones said, I can't wait to sh go to this with my daughters. I can't wait. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it is important that you try and find the women and bring them into those positions. So that's good. But as, as an artist, you're only as good as your tools and your compatriots. So there's going to be that bit of a, of a it, you have to decide how far you're going to compromise just to have it all one way. And it can work. But, you know, I think that there is a dilemma for some women directors where they're, you know, you've got to have it all one. If you want to do that and you're willing to do that, you will find, I think you will find it, but you may not at this point in life find every single one. So it's, it's going to be a developmental process um, to get that many women into roles that are notoriously, historically male grips, gaffers, you know, they need to come in. They need to come in, and I think they will. Uh, yeah, and, and it's important that we work together in all kinds of different ways, because part of the reason that uh, we didn't get Hillary Clinton is because the uh, my male friends I could see in the media were saying things like, I cross my legs whenever I see her. I mean, what does that mean? You know, uh, she reminds me of my first wife outside Alamone. Okay, it's because <laughs> the, the only women they had seen in authority over them were their mothers. Yeah. So when they saw Teachers. Hillary Clinton, they felt regressed to childhood, literally, because they had never seen in their lives a woman in authority over them, only their mothers. And until we get this as a natural, you know, all about talent or whatever it is, we are not going to get females in leadership anywhere. And it is good to have that mix because that's the way that's the way the world is. For men to see women who are powerful I as directors, DPs, or anything, not just in the costume design, makeup, hair, and editing, it, it when they see that, that word spreads. That's how you get it done. And uh, I and so I it changes I, how they vote. I mean, you know, yeah. it's just terribly important. That's the most important thing. <laughs> uh, another question in the in the back. Eva Kempner, I've been a documentary filmmaker for 40 years, and almost all my films were um, edited by women with full crews. Um, but I'm also very politically involved. I, I live in Washington, D.C. We have no voting rights in Congress. I always have to say that. The film is magnificent. I felt like my whole past, and Bella, bless her soul, to have yes. her. <laughs> you, just everyone's got to see it, which has to do with the fact, when are we going to start taking it out right away? Because we've got to get a woman nominated for president or vice president, and this film will be so encouraging, especially to the young people. So We, we, we agree with you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I started emailing people like women in film chapter. I mean, we've got to get, I know there's a whole push for voting, you know, to register to vote. We've got to get this right away. Out. And, and I think, you know, this is, this is another thing that we haven't touched on enough, about, which is, yeah, it's Gloria. But it's also Dorothy Pittman Hughes, Wilma Mankiller, Dolores Huerta, um, uh, Lorraine Toussaint plays Flo Kennedy. But look at the female, the wi women at the Houston Women's Conference. Look at those women on that stage talking. This is another thing that, exactly, but also incredible women in power, incredibly inspiring women. And I think when you said, who's the audience, that's why I want men to see this, because what you see in this film and what inspired me was watching women work together on a very um, uh, intellectual, politically active, humorous, look at the humor, the love between those women at Ms. Magazine. She said it, it it's real. I mean, of course there's adversity. There's the Betty Frieda, da, 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 da. But, but we're not about that. Right now we're about the harmony. 
and were about women being able to lead, work together, support each other. My mother was is 98 and wrote a book, Running Against the Wind. She was in politics all her life, and I watched her trashed by women in the 19, early 60s and 50s. They were the, the jealousy, the kind of thing that happened with, Laura, uh, with uh, Hillary. It's enough already. We need to have women supporting women, and the men are already there, or they're coming along, mm -hmm. let's say. So I agree yeah. with you. We've got to get it out. We have a question. We have a question in the back. I see you. Hi. Um, my name is Kaya, and I'm uh, originally from South Africa. I'm a local filmmaker here um, in, in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm glad you are addressing the, the issues with people of color in film. Uh, I'm grateful for those Tyler Perry f uh, film studios and, st and such. We are s still yet to see that unfold. Um, my question to you is, um, how do you de-vilify strong women like that? And, and I have uh, uh, Winnie Mandela in mind, being from South Africa. Yeah. How do you, how do you um, humanize a character like that? Well, that's what movies are for, you yeah. know? I mean, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, okay, it, I'm so proud of this movie, and it should not take a movie about a white feminist to introduce people to black feminists who have always outnumbered white feminists from the beginning, right. okay? And look at the results of the last election, you know, when 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton and 51% of white women voted for Trump. I rest my case, all right. So, Go back to the stats. You know, so, so our hope is that this introduces people to these great women and that they have movies of their own, as Winnie Mandela should have a, a movie. There. I mean, it, movies, movies are, you know, all of human history, we've been sitting around campfires telling our stories. And in the campfire setting, everyone spoke in a circle. And so there was a time when everyone spoke and everyone listened for everybody. And it movies are the current campfire. So it is so important that the mo movies look like the country. Right? I saw a few more hands, and I think we have time for maybe one or two real quick questions. <laughs> Um, first of all, it's just an honor to be in the same room as both of you. Um, but I'm a student, I'm 20, so this whole movie is about your journey as a young woman to this chair right now. So I'm just wondering, for both of you, really, what advice you have for the next generation of hopeful Gloria's really? Oh, I have. Okay. Here, here, here is my advice. Okay. This is totally my advice. Do not listen to me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Listen to yourself. There is an authentic, true voice in there. You are a miracle that could never, never, never exist before or again. You're a unique combination of heredity and environment. Each of us is, right? <laughs> and crying is a good thing. <laughs> uh, and listen to yourself. And we are here to support you, right? And we need to hear your story so we can support your story. And, and also, one of, the, one of the reasons why I love the um, younger Gloria part, the your age part, was she was a terrible speaker. She, you know, the Gloria that we see now and have seen for the last 40 years is not the Gloria of her 20s. She's not the one who had confidence that she could go out on that stage. Um, and I think that that's what, what I hope happens with women your age, is that they say, all right, okay, all right, can I do this? Yes, I have to do it. I don't have a choice, and that's what she's saying. And here's what you learn, you don't die. I mean, yeah, you, right. <laughs> die. you think you're gonna die, but you don't die. And, and also the secret to it is just honesty, too. I mean, I discovered, as in the movie, that if I said to the audience, how many people here are afraid of public speaking, to, you know, right. and I'm afraid of public speaking, that suddenly everybody was with you. You know, you didn't feel like you had to perform. I think that was the perfect question to end on. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you both again. Please give another round of applause. Thank you.